Hello everybody, I hope you're doing well today. I'm just carrying on with where I left off at the end of the last episode. Judith had come to the same conclusion over the previous few minutes. She was on her own, and the shocking realisation had crept through her body like ice water. After all, if Bex had managed to get a hold of Tanaka, they'd have arrived ages ago. Something must have gone very badly wrong. Go on, Danny said to her, and Judith's focus snapped back into the room. Tell me about this link I have with these other two men. That's easy enough, Judith said, even though she felt entirely numb. All three of you went to the same secondary school, Sir William Borlaces. So what? Is that all you've got? There's only two secondary schools in the town. Loads of people went to the same school, and I bet I'm not even the same age as those two other people. No, that's true. Elliot is one year older than you, and Dandy is four years younger. So how could I be linked to this Andy guy? I don't even remember him. Oh, you do? He was a top athlete at the time. Not that you'd know it to look at him now. But then, as a photograph reminded me, we were all very much thinner when we were younger. But that we should really be nothing in... But what we should really be noting is Andy's height. Because there's no such thing as a shorter rower, is there? Oh, sorry. No, there isn't. But there is if you're the cox. In fact, the cox has to be as short as possible. And thin. And that's what Andy used to be, wasn't he? A mere slip of a thing. As he boasted to my good friend, Beck Starling, he'd been quite the athlete in his youth. We dismissed the comment at the time, but it was true. He, you and Elliot were a triumphant rowing team for your school, weren't you? For the first time, Judith thought she saw a panic dart in Danny's eyes. That's right. The three of you may have drifted apart over the decades since then, but back when you were teenagers, you were one of the best rowing teams your school had ever produced. As a Cox pair, I now know, which is one Cox, who was Andy. The youngster with Gill and Cunning to navigate the route, and two much older, taller and stronger lads than you and Elliot do to do the rowing. I imagine you cleaned up at all of the regattas. This is guesswork. Not at all. I went to Elliot's office once I worked out that rowing was the connection. And guess what? He removed a rowing team photo from the wall since the last time I'd been there. He was, he has rather a habit of removing framed pictures from the walls. Now I think about it. But that was all the confirmation I needed to know I was on the right track. And the fact that his wife was so angry at me. I think a bit like your wife, Daisy, has had her suspicions about Elliot for some time. And it's similarly, similarly been driving her mad. Anyway, the missing photo proved to me that there was something incriminating about a rowing team from Elliot's past. So, who else was in that photo? Sadly, records back then haven't much survived the modern day, but you know what it's like when you solve part of a crossword clue. The rest of it is so often, the rest of it so often falls into place. I tried to think who else Elliot could have rowed with. Initially, I wondered if it was Stefan, but as I've already said, Stefan is on record saying he hated rowing, and that's when I remembered Bex telling me that you and Liz had met as young rowers. You were the third person from Elliot's boat I was looking for. Judith could see that Danny was clenching and unclenching his jaw. No, not saying anything? I suppose not, but now I could start to make sense of the deaths, because, as you said, you, Elliot and Andy don't have much to do with each other. But you last rode together in Elliot's final year at school, which was 1980. 40 years ago, exactly. So a perfect excuse for a school reunion. Which is why Liz had a diary entry saying rowing dinner for Monday the 5th of August. Because it wasn't her rowing dinner she was mar marking. She'd merely put rowing dinner in her diary because, as a good wife, she was making a note of when you'd be at to your important dinner so she didn't double book anything for that night. And I'm sure you, Elliot and Andy, had a great evening together. In whatever private dining room you'd hired. In black tie, no doubt. Yes, I can well imagine the three of you in some oak panel private room in a fancy pub somewhere near here. All togged up, all in agreement at what a disgrace it was. You can't smoke cigars indoors these days. But here's the thing. Monday the 5th was the same day that Elliot went to see Stefan in his gallery. I bet Elliot was fuming when you saw him. In fact, he must have been, knowing what then followed. You see, I think he told you everything. How Stefan was a crook. Which, I'm sad to say, I now realise was the truth. 
because he stole a valuable Rothko painting from Elliot decades ago. And Elliot told you all about it, how he argued with Stefan at Henley a few weeks before. But he must have also told you what he'd done since then. You see, Elliot was so incensed by his argument with Stefan at Henley, he decided to wreak revenge. To wreak revenge? Hmm. He wanted his Rothko back, but how to do it? Well, since Elliot has always been so desperate to prove his talent, he decided he'd paint a forgery of it. But again, how could he do that? He'd not seen the picture in decades, and he'd have to somehow get the real frame from the real Rothko onto his forgery so Stefan wouldn't notice the difference. So, Elliot broke into Stefan's house. Just to take the just to take photos of why of of the Rothko, I think, and to measure the frame and see how it all fastened together and so on. But once he'd done that, he left. Which is why, when Stefan returned later on and called the police because there'd been a break-in, he couldn't prove that anything had been stolen. Nothing had been stolen. It's simply been a fact-finding mission for Elliot. Next, Elliot set about rediscovering his ability at painting Rothko's, reminding himself of the technique and the palette required, which explains all of the Rothko-style paintings we found him burning in his garden later on. He was getting rid of practice canvases. But Stefan worked out that Elliot had been behind the break-in. Maybe he saw that his Rothko wasn't quite hanging as straight as on the wall as it should have been. Or maybe Elliot saw Stefan and taunted him somehow. We'll never know. But whatever it was that tipped Stefan off, it was enough to make him want to get Elliot into his office and accuse him of the break-in. And also to threaten him that he could go to the police. So yes, my guess is that Elliot was in a foul mood when you all met up for dinner that night. And I'm sure he added that. As far as he was concerned, Stefan deserved to die. So, what happened next? Well, I imagine it was Andy who chipped in next, because he had problems of his own. Although, I bet he dressed them up to look less criminal than they were. I'm sure he spun you a tale of how he looked after his client Ezra as he slowly died of cancer, and how just before his death, Ezra had left his estate to his trusty solicitor. All a lie, of course, as Ezra had left everything to his wonderful neighbour, Iqbal. But I bet Andy told you that, as Ezra was so close to death. He'd not been capable of signing his new will, so he'd had no choice but to force the signatures of, of the witnesses. And I'm sure Andy stuck the boot into Iqbal, the interfering neighbour. How Iqbal had discovered that the witnesses' names were old pupils from Borlase's grammar school, who died before the will was signed. And how Iqbal had even had the gall to send him the proof in the form of a page of obituaries from the Borlasian magazine he'd torn out. In fact, Andy was in considerably more hot water even than Elliot. He committed a massive fraud. He was off to prison if he couldn't silence Iqbal. And if Elliot wasn't the first person to say that Stefan deserved to die, I'm sure that's what Andy said about Iqbal. Someone should kill Iqbal. But how do you even commit murder? Well, if you own an auction house, I can't imagine it's too hard to lay your hands on a vintage weapon, like a Second World War luja. Not if you know a few dodgy dealers. And I'm sure Elliot must have done. But still, how do you do it and get away with it? I wonder if that's when you confess that you wanted your wife dead as well. After all, sometimes it's easier to speak the truth to a relative stranger than to someone you know well, isn't it? Because if Liz died, you'd inherit the land the rowing centre is built on. You'd be able to sell it and become a multi-millionaire. And once you'd confessed your darkest secrets to the others, the idea occurred to you, the, occurred to the three of you, that you could each commit murder for the person to your left, as it were, using the same gun to make it look like it was all one person. And with a false trail of antique Masonic medallions, no doubt supplied by Andy Bishop to make it look as look as though the same person were carrying out each murder. Danny raised his hand again and pointed it towards Judas' head. You're going to shut up now. You don't want another death on your hands. That's where you're wrong. That's exactly what I want. Seeing the madness in Danny's eyes, Judas realised that he no longer cared for the consequences of his actions. She wouldn't be able to talk him down or appeal to his rational side. He just wants her dead. Dead at any price. And finally, Judas knew the truth. Her plan had failed. She was on her own with Danny Curtis, and there was nothing she could do to stop him from killing her. 
For Susie's part, she was still standing panic-stricken under the weeping willow, feeling more and more miserable and getting more and more wet. What was going on inside Judith's house? There must be something she could do to help, but what could it be? She was on the wrong side of the river and had no means of crossing it. Susie stepped out from the weeping willow and approached the river. She looked at the mass of the water as it swept past. There was no way she could cross the river at the best of times. She couldn't swim, let alone get across with the river running this fast and at night and in the middle of a storm. And Emma was still no use as she shivered at Susie's side. But there was nothing else, Susie. But there was something else, Susie realised as she stood in the driving rain. Bex and the police simply weren't coming. And that meant that she was Judith's last and only hope. This helped make the decision for her. Perhaps at some deep level, Susie had known all along what she, should, what she would do next. We're going to save Judith, she shouted at Emma over the howling wind. We're going to save Judith, you and me together. Susie bent down and did the lace on her boots and kicked them off. Next, she took off her wide-brimmed hat and raincoat and dropped them to the floor. She then strode into the river, Emma excitedly at her side, wanting to join in with whatever it was Susie was doing. Susie was almost immediately swept off her feet, even as she struck out with her arms and legs. She tried to splash her way across the river, but the current was too strong. Panicking wildly and swallowing lungfuls of water, Susie tried to make headway, but... She was being carried too fast downstream from Judith's house and there was no way to get back, even if she managed to get out of the water, which, with a sudden realisation, Susie realised she never would. It was pitch dark. Rain was hammering down on the water all around. The swell of the river lifted her up, spun her around and then su sucked her down, time, time and time again. And each time she went under, it seemed to be for longer. It was so cold. So very, very cold. And she was feeling so tired, so heavy and tired. She couldn't keep battling. The river was so much stronger than her. And then Susie was pulled under by the current. And this time she knew it would be for the very last time. She wouldn't be coming up for air again. Okay, everybody, that's all I'm reading for you today. I hope you have enjoyed the episode. And I will see you again for a new one shortly. Bye.